The third chapter of Chuck Swindoll's book, Moses, a man of selfless dedication, the, the chapter's titled, God's Will, My Way. By way of uh, review, we talked about the principles that were associated with Israel's bondage. Hard times do not erase God's promises. Harsh treatment does not escape God's notice. Heavy tests do not eclipse God's concern. And we're gonna see an interesting verse here. And God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. And God saw the people of Israel and God knew. So I've uh, bolded some of those verbs because we know that God is all knowing and all hearing and all seeing. And so this particular verse is put in a language to be um, people oriented. And then bullet four, submitting to civil authority has its limits. We talked about the birth of Moses and we asked the question, what did Moses' household look like? We're gonna ask that question again several times as we go through the study. This one is uh, when the baby was in the reeds, hoping that something good would happen. We talked about Pharaoh and his daughter and how Moses is gonna leave his household and go on to be with, uh, with Pharaoh's daughter. And so Moses in the basket, Moses in the palace, where was Moses' family and what were they thinking? First of all, Miriam, she went from scared to death with the baby in the river to thrilled to death that the baby's now home and mom is being paid to nurse that baby. Jochebed, she went from baby lost to baby gained. Amram, he went from the bottom of the rock pile to the top. We talked about uh, the over there with Colossians chapter three, the four priorities there. And when he went to work the day that basket was put in the river, I'm guessing that he was not paying much attention to his work. His mind was on that baby. His mind was on his firstborn standing in the, in the creek watching. His mind is what is going to happen. He was at the bottom of the rock pile. When the baby comes home and there's another uh, paycheck coming in for what they would have been doing for free, he's now at the top of the work pile. Then there's Moses. He went from being nurtured as a slave to nurtured to be their master. And now Aaron, you know, he, wasn't, he was three years old with the first episode, but now when Moses is weaned and goes back to Pharaoh's house, He's not the big brother anymore. There's a family in our church that there's some siblings that aren't big brothers anymore. And I don't think anybody in this family forgot the years they had with that baby. We'll be going through these names again when we fast forward 40 years. And then, of course, Pharaoh's daughter, she's part of the family, right? She's going to be the new mom. She's unwittingly being used as part of God's plan. So God's will, my way. We're going to read two different versions from Exodus and from Acts. One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, <clears throat> And seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And when he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? And he answered, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. And when Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now, Acts chapter 7, I find to be a really interesting chapter. It's the stoning of Stephen. And here's this man staring at certain death in the face. And what does he do? He gives an extemporaneous sermon and he shares things about the Old Testament that aren't shared in the Old Testament. I find that truly amazing. He was calm under fire. 
But here is the same story through a different lens. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian. So when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. We're going to look again at Moses' family. Where were they? What were they thinking? So Pharaoh's daughter, Moses is 40. We're going to put Pharaoh's daughter in her 50s. She has had this man in her household for four decades. What would a mother of a 40-year-old be thinking about? Why can't you find yourself a good Egyptian girl? Why do you keep staring over at those slaves? You're supposed to be working on another PhD. There's something that's amiss here with my son. What's he doing? What's he thinking? A mother has a great intuition that nobody else has. Jochebed, she might be in her 60s because Moses wasn't a firstborn. Miriam, were, I'm guessing, was about 10 years old when he was born, so 40 plus 10, 50. Uh, 40 plus 10, Miriam is 50, which means mom could be upper 60s. We don't know. But what's Jochebed thinking? She had lost her son now, coming up on 30-some years. Maybe she heard about this guy that hit somebody. We don't know. Is she a grandmother at this point? The Bible doesn't say if Miriam ever got married. The Bible does say that Aaron got married. He had four sons, but it doesn't say when those sons were born. Is it possible that God blessed Jochebed to be a grandmother you know, at the appropriate time, because I'm going to tell you something. When she lost Moses, she never forgot. When I was five, I had a two-year-old brother that died of leukemia. My mother lived another 50 years after that. And when we found mom, she had this apron, and sticking in one of the pockets of the apron was a picture of my two-year-old brother. She never forgot. The heart of Mary of Jochebed. Hebrews chapter 11 talks about by faith. And by faith, Jochebed was blessed for a little window of time where she was nursing that baby, nurturing that baby, teaching that baby the oral passages of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But then she lost that baby. Where's Amram? If he's also in his 60s, he may be dead. He certainly has lost his strength. You're looking right now at a shadow of my former self. We don't know if he's limping along, helping the other laborers, but he too has never forgotten. Where's Miriam? I have two question marks next to her name because we don't know if she was really 50. The Bible says she was never married. Was she a worker? Was she a catalyst? What was Miriam doing? And then we have Aaron. He's now 43 years old. Where's Aaron? He's up there building those cities of Pithom and Ramses. And where's Moses? Stay tuned. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart. Now, Jeremiah 17 says this, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? If somebody says to you, just follow your heart, that might make sense if God put something inside your heart, but the heart is desperately wicked. Now, where's God during all this? We finished the study of Esther, and we asked the question, where is God? God's name's not even printed in the book. 
But God is behind the scenes here, watching all these things. And we're going to see a passage that says, now, the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, died. And the people groaned. And God saw it and remembered. God's behind the scenes. So we asked the question, where was Moses? Well, there's Moses right there, okay? And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds. He was well-educated. He was well-spoken. He was mighty. He was powerful. But he was vulnerable. He knew the will of God, but not the God of that will. He knew that his destiny was going to liberate the Hebrews, liberate the Israelites. But he didn't follow God's timing. And so we're going to see failure, steps to failure, and what it takes to come out of that downward spiral. God's will, my way. The impact of one act, steps to failure. Uh, Chuck Swindoll uses the example, if you're driving down the highway, you hit black ice and you jerk the steering wheel. I don't know if you've ever been on black ice. I don't know if you've ever been a skid. I don't know if you've ever been in a spin. But once that car starts spinning, you're out of control. And that's what happened with Moses. He didn't have an opportunity to think through a plan B. So there was an act, the killing of the Egyptians, that was initiated by Moses and not by God. It was an act that was energized by the flesh and not by the spirit. It was an act that leaded to confusion on his part and on the part of the Israelites and failure. And there were unbearable results. He went from the palace to the wilderness and he went from desert, he's living with a silver spoon, to desert. Now, my mother told me this in one of the spelling bees many, many years ago that the difference between desert and desert the double S's, that stands for strawberry shortcake. And I never got them confused ever since. The desert. Now, this verse applies to the people of Israel after their 40-year tour. But it also applies to Moses, to his own personal 40-year tour. Keep in mind, he had two tours, one as solo and one as a leader. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you. What was Moses like the day he hit that Egyptian? We just covered it. Well-educated, well-spoken, mighty, powerful, vulnerable. To humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart. Now, that word desert is an interesting desert. It comes from the Hebrew midbar. And that word hidbar could mean driving, and it could mean speech. Now, unless Moses was talking to himself out in the desert, somebody else was doing the, desert, doing the talking, and it wasn't those sheep. It was God that was doing the, the talking. Now, what's also interesting about this word midbar is its root. It comes from the word debar, which means to arrange. So God arranged it. That, and that, that Moses could be driven into the desert so that he could hear God's voice. So, four lessons from failure. Number one, spiritual ends are not achieved by carnal means. I'll give you an interesting example. Let's say you just gave a great big donation to Mount Vernon Christian Church but you got that great big donation because you cheated on your income taxes. That's a carnal message, a carnal means, and the spiritual end, God can't bless that. Timing is as important as action. Waiting in God is the mark of wisdom and strength, not foolishness and weakness. In Isaiah, we hear that those that wait on the Lord shall mount up with the strength of eagle's wings. Waiting on the Lord is a tough thing. I read once where Dwight Eisenhower, after he launched the D-Day invasion, 
course, he's over there in England in the war room. He sat back in his chair and he said, all we have to do now is wait. That's one of the hardest things I've ever been asked to do is to wait. So timing is as important as the action. Hiding the wrong does not erase it. What did Moses do with that Egyptian? In the sand. What did Adam and Eve do? They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Hiding the wrong does not erase it. And spiritual leadership is God-appointed, not self-assumed. So steps to failure. The idea was initiated by Moses and not by God. It was energized by the flesh. It was an act that led to confusion and failure, and there, were, uh, there was an unbearable result. We're going to step through these things. Numbers 1 and 2, an idea initiated by Moses but from his flesh. There's two interesting verses here, two different translations. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers. NIV took some liberty and got rid of the word heart, and they simply said when, 40, when Moses was 40 years old, he decided. God didn't decide. He decided to visit his fellow Israelites. Was that striking down, King James says slew, was that striking down premeditated? Was it a reflex action? I'll give you an example. Now, Willie would never, ever do this. But if I was close to Willie and he decided to take a swing at me, the Bible says to turn your other cheek, right? But I think if that fist was coming, getting ready to impale on my face, I think I would, without thinking, protect myself. That's a reflex action. It's muscle memory. It just happens. Was this premeditated and a reflex action? He looked this way and that. I added, and not up. Not heavenward. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. God's will, my way. Contrast Moses versus Esther. And one of the key verses in Esther is, for such a time as this. Moses just happened to be at that work site. I'm assuming it's a work site because that's all the uh, Hebrew men did. There was a, an altercation, and he stepped in. Esther, they spent three days of fasting. The Bible never says praying because the word pray is not in the book of Esther either, but I'm just assuming that they fasted and prayed. And then she had two banquets before she said what she needed to say to the king. Very different. That was God's will and God's way. In Moses' case, it was God's will and Moses' way. Back to that word heart again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. That's a whole lot easier to read than to apply. I'm just speaking personally. God's will, God's timing. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. He didn't send Jesus during the Babylonian captivity. He didn't send Jesus when Daniel was over there with the kings of Persia. He didn't send Jesus when Alexander the Great was marching all over the globe. He didn't send Jesus when the Romans were doing their thing, although the Romans were in control. He sent Jesus when the fullness had time had come. There was Caesar, there was Herod, there was the high priest. Everything was in place for Jesus to be born exactly as was prophesied. Moses killed one Egyptian and God took out the entire army. You might have some effect in a spiritual exercise, doing it your way. I mean, you might not be totally ineffective. When you do things God's way, you can see some powerful things. 
Moses killed just one Egyptian, but God took out the entire army. Who were the eyewitnesses? Now, all my life I was thinking, okay, there comes Moses, and he walks up there, and there's one Egyptian, and there's one Hebrew, and you see that on that right photograph. On the left, you see some guys in the background that are laboring. I don't know if that'll do anything. Whoa. And you see one guy peeking around the corner. We're going to take a look again at Exodus and Acts, and you can decide, was there one eyewitness, the man who was saved from the Egyptian, or were there more? Who are the eyewitnesses? One day Moses had grown up. He went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He saw an Egyptian beating one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And when he went out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together. Was it the same guy plus one? Were they two other guys? The Bible doesn't say. He was 40 years old. He came into his heart to visit his brothers, plural, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them, now we still don't know if he went, his intent was to go to see everybody and he saw just one. We don't know. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand. If this was written specifically for that scene, might it have said he supposed that his brother would understand. I don't have a conclusion. I'm just trying to get your, your minds going here. And he supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they, plural, did not understand. He understood, I want to rescue Israel, but they didn't understand it that way. Was the Israelite alone? Was there dialogue after the killing? He's burying this guy in the sand, and he says, look, bro, I did that because we're going to rescue Israel, and tomorrow we're going to start a rebellion. We don't know if that conversation happened. Did the Israelite or Israelites uncover the body? The Bible never says what happened to that guy that got buried in the sand. And on the following day, he appeared to them, plural, where did the them all of a sudden come? It refers back to the brothers. As they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? Why did he go back to the scene of the crime? Now, if there were multiple eyewitnesses, then when Moses, the Bible says, he looked here and there. He was looking for Egyptians if there were multiples. What he was showing was, I'm here to rescue the Israelites and we're going to start right here and right now. So why did he go back to the scene of the crime? Was it to see if the body was still under the sand? My contention would be that he went back to start the rebellion, but the people didn't understand. And when he was told... Who made you a prince and a judge over us? Are you going to kill me just like you killed the Egyptian? Everything that mounted up to those 40 years, except the time with Jacobed, got erased. His PhDs, his military victories, his favor with all of the Egyptians, he tipped his hand. He was on the Hebrew side. He went from hero to zero. He went from victor to victim. He went from hunter to prey. And he went from the palace to the wilderness. He answered, who made you a prince and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. He went from surprise to confusion to fear. And when Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian. I love this verse. 
although its application is many times painful for me. The reason we have these stories in the Old Testament is so that we can learn from them. If you're down the hall and you're in the Tiny Tots class, you'll have a picture of Moses and you won't have Moses killing the Egyptian. You'll have a picture of Moses in the baby basket, right? We're up here in this class. And what does the passage of Moses mean for us today? It's written for our instruction. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and he went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now that word Midian means brawling or contention or strife. So we're going to take Midian and desert. We read about the backside of the desert. The desert, he was, there was an arrangement where God drove him so he could listen because there was a contention. There was a contention between Moses and Pharaoh. Pharaoh wanted to kill him. And there was a contention within Moses himself. I thought I was going to be the liberator, and here I am out in the backside of the desert. And we're going to see an English word that comes right out of Midian. You see that word contention? We're going to see where Moses was content. He was content in Midian. He was content in a place of contention. So there's a, I don't know if you can see that map, but there's the journey from Egypt to Midian. He got up and went around the Red Sea. He's going to split the waters later on. He went up, he went around the Red Sea. He marched across the Sinai Peninsula and he came over there to Midian. Now I'm going to jump ahead because the map's there. I'm going to come back to you. The very bottom of the Sinai Peninsula is Horeb. And so if you, I, I know you can't see the scales there, but if Midian was over on that side of that gulf, then it would take him maybe 200 miles to get to Horeb from Midian. What that tells me is he was a nomad. Those deserts, they don't have enough grass for a, a, a decent number of sheep to just stay there and graze and graze and graze. And it's not going to rotate pasture. He has to move on. Later on, if the clock behaves itself, we'll see a photograph of Horeb and we'll expand a little bit on that as well. So Pharaoh heard of this and he sat down. Think of what Moses was doing. Pharaoh is after him. Pharaoh has an army. We we're going to read about the chariots and everything. And Moses is getting out of town. He gets rid of his headdress. He gets rid of his sword. He gets rid of his fancy robes. He might be dressed like that guy going across the desert. If, if I was a fugitive, I would try to get rid of anything and everything that people would recognize me by. So he gets rid of all that and he sits down. We live in a pace today when we need to sit down. Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. And my guess is everybody in this room knows that part of the verse. But look at the second part of that verse. I will be exalted among the nations. One of the signs of Christ's coming, as the Bible tells us in Luke's gospel, that the nations will be perplexed. And this nation is no different. In fact, this nation is so perplexed, sometimes I don't even recognize the nation that I grew up in. But God will be exalted. We need to sit down and remember that God's in control. Just like we went through all of Moses' family, where was God? God was behind the scenes. God is ready to take care of all of our problems in his way and in his timing, and he will be exalted in the earth. Second thing, he sat down by a well. Now, anytime you see water in the Bible, it's a picture of the word. He sat down with the word. And just as a point of note, we're thirstier than we realize. Now, I don't know about you, but this weather we've had, high humidity, if you're doing any servile work out there, and I've been doing a lot lately, 
I'm throwing the water down my, down my throat. And if I don't, I start cramping up from dehydration. Well, there's a thing of spiritual dehydration as well. And if we're not drinking from the well, we're going to cramp up. <laughs> 